All right, you all, my name is Adam Conrad. I'm from Porters Lake, Nova Scotia, Canada, and I gotta say, today marks the 47th anniversary of the passing of this man right here, Elvis Presley, who took the world by surprise that many years ago. I mean, if anybody was uh, underestimated, it was Elvis Presley. Elvis was a guy that overcame many obstacles, many obstacles that was laid in front of him. He overcame it all. Uh, you're talking about he was canceled from the Ed Sullivan show because he's giant, wiggling, jiving of his legs like this here in his picture. He was jiggling and jiving and they had to take him off the air because uh, they didn't exactly take him off the air right away. They, uh, they fribbled from the waist up because people back then thought that was a terrible thing and later on, today when you look at it, you know, we, we laugh at it. You know, it's just basically nothing. But, you know, years went on, I read books on Elvis, but I got to say is, does any of you people remember that fateful day on August 16th, 1977, when the world's greatest singer and entertainer to ever walk on stage, Elvis Presley, passed away. There are some people to this very day think Elvis is still alive. How we all wish that was true. How we all wished people would find him, though he'll get up to do one last show, which we highly doubt it. But in spite of all their claims and all their uh, conspiracy theorists that have been going around, their, their reports of finding Elvis was often and always was unfounded. Uh, August 16th, 1977, at 11 o'clock at night, Elvis was, in this picture here, seen by the press for the last time. This is the very picture that you see of Elvis that was seen alive by the press. They took the picture of it. It was August uh, 15th, 1977, just one hour before August 16th, 1977, and, uh, Elvis was going to the dentist to have his uh, teeth worked on. Not far from Graceland. Little did Elvis and the doctors, his dentist know, I should say, that it will be Elvis' last trip to the dentist. But when Elvis got home from the dentist, you know, he was known for uh, hanging around his piano, singing to his family and friends, because Elvis was known for having his friends and his family living in Graceland along with them. And uh, not only that, but they decided to go play racquetball. And he would play that for God hours until at least 6 o'clock in the morning. And then after that, you know, I mean, that night, I mean, when they would play racquetball, uh, Billy Smith, Elvis's first cousin, stated that when they played basketball, he used to take the ball, he used to beat the crap out of it. They used to try to hurt as they can to, 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 to hit the other person hard as they can with the ball. And, and, they, and they, had, they had some hell of a game. They the Billy Smith would say at times, and, uh, and uh, Elvis, uh, when he went to hit the ball with his racket, I guess he hit the back of his shin, and it hurt Elvis something fierce, you know, and Elvis lifted up his pant leg, and Billy Smith said, well, well, ain't can't be hurting because he ain't bruised, so, uh, you know, so that ended that for the night, so he went back over into Graceland to his music room. And I guess he started playing the piano. He started singing uh, your Spanish, your, your sweet Spanish eyes, it was called. Little did they realize that would be the very last song that Elvis would sing. And uh, after that, you know, Elvis got tired. It was, it was around 6 o'clock in the morning. Elvis wanted to go to bed. He was tired, you know, because he, 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 was, he was getting ready to go on tour. Because a lot of these don't realize when Elvis was getting ready to go on tour, he had one last tour, then he was off for a two-year hiatus to rest. He didn't make it. Uh, Elvis uh, he went upstairs to his bedroom, talked to his, uh, fian his then fiance at the time, Ginger Oliver, telling her, now, I want to read, I wanna read my, my Bible in the, the washroom like he always did, novels. He used, he used to read all kinds of books on different types of religions. He, he, he wrote, he, he, he knew it all. He... If you're going to ask Elvis to read you a chapter of the Bible, I guarantee you, he knows exactly where it, what it is that you're asking him to read in that Bible. He'll find it a lot faster than you or anybody else will. And, uh, you know, he went in the, when he went to the washroom, you know, Ginger Oliver said, 
don't fall asleep in the washroom this time. And Elvis looked at Ginger and Palmer and said, I won't. And he shut the door and, you know, he do his thing. So Ginger Aldrin got up around, what was it, around uh, 9 o'clock, two hours, so just before they, three hours, as you see, just before, when they went to get some sleep. Elvis never returned from the washroom to, to their bed where he's supposed to be. So she went to the washroom and she uh, opened the door, see what was going on with Elvis. And then she found Elvis on the floor, face down in a fetal position, with his pants pulled down. And she thought Elvis fainted. So she picked up the intercom, called downstairs, Joe Esposito picked up the phone and asked what was wrong. And she said, Elvis fainted. So she thought. So Joe Esposito ran upstairs. Joe Esposito was the very first person to work on Elvis. He had no CPR training. He had no first aid training. He didn't know anything about CPR, how to revive people during emergency situations. And, uh, I remember Joe Esposito saying in an interview scene that he was massaging Elvis' heart. But when he said when he rolled Elvis over, his face was blue, his tongue was blue, and he said he knew Elvis was gone. And uh, they called 911, but back at the time, there was no 911. It was just, you know, call the operator or whatever. And uh, Joe Esposito was the one that picked up the phone, and he said... Uh, I mean, we need an ambulance at Elvis Presley's house. And they knew exactly. Because everybody at the time knew where Elvis lived, Graceland. And they said, don't worry, we'll have, we'll have the gates open for you when you arrive. But the, he didn't tell the paramedics who the ambulance was for. It was for Elvis. So the paramedics, they got in there. They were working on him. And uh, before the paramedics got to Elvis, Elvis pulled these, Elvis's, <laughs> uh, Joe Esposito pulled up Elvis's pants so he could look presentable and they, so he's not such in a bad way when they see him. And uh, they, the paramedics got him out. But Joyce Mizzito said when they were carrying Elvis out, he was gone. He's, he's, there's no way you're coming back from this. And uh, at 3.30 in the afternoon on August 16th, 1977, at 3.30 in the afternoon, the paramedics were working on Elvis in the emergency room at Baptist Memorial Hospital. Elvis's family was in the family room waiting to see what's going on. And the doctor walked in. He looked at Joe Esposito and he looked at Billy Smith. He said, Elvis had left. And Joe, Joe Esposito said, They all broke down. They're crying and they're sobbing. Couldn't get over what just happened to this. It was Larry Geller who said, there's no way Elvis is gone. He's, he's just so strong. He had a big presence with him. He's just a strong, just everything about him was just a strong energy presence with him. He just, he was different from all the rest. He had this big presence with him. He, he couldn't, he didn't believe he was gone. And that, and, and he said the paramedic, the, uh, the doctor who was working on Elvis, looked at him and said, he's gone. And uh, before that, before they got Elvis and the uh, ambulance, it was in an interview I noticed two years ago on YouTube. Joe uh, Esposito was doing an interview. I noticed on YouTube two years ago, so the interview could have been long before he died, obviously, because he wouldn't do an interview if he passed away. And Joe Esposito has stated when Elvis passed away, he flushed all the prescribed medications that Elvis had and he opened down to the to down the washroom on the toilet the best he could he did and he said uh Elvis left a suicide note when he passed away and he said he didn't want to he said he burnt it because he didn't want the place the Memphis police department seen it he said I'm going to burn it and he did and he said when I burnt that note he said he said I want to protect Elvis's legacy everything that he was because how is Elvis's fans Gonna succumb to the reality that they're that, that they're a hero because Elvis was a hero back then, and he still is. He's that strong of a, he got that strong of a presence about him. He said, "How would they react that if I were to tell them that their hero Elvis Presley just committed suicide?" He said, "That's why I burnt the note. I want to protect them." He said, "If I'm Elvis's re real friend, I'm gonna do that." 
he said he knew Elvis had problems. He couldn't, he just couldn't find the energy to reach him to the help that he needed. He said Colonel signed him contracts. Colonel Tom Parker signed Elvis contracts, just the contracts that he could have been on her. Because Elvis, a lot of people don't realize Elvis's health wasn't that bad of shape. Colonel signed him up contracts. I mean, they had a blow up in Las Vegas. You know, Colonel had Elvis working two shows a night for a full moon. What was it, a month straight? And Elvis was literally on financial ruins. He's on his, he said Elvis was on his last $500,000 to his name. He was that broke. And the Colonel literally just using Elvis as a, as a, as a cash cow because Elvis was really just, he just simply wore out. And uh, he said, to some of these people, it was no surprise that things resulted in what they had done. Because uh, Larry Geller, when he got to Graceland, uh, he stated, uh, Elvis's uncle came up to him. This was before Larry Geller got, went to the Baptist Memorial Hospital and he realized Elvis was actually gone. Larry Geller said he went to Graceland. He didn't know what was going on. He said, uh, Elvis's uncle came up to me, walked up to, to Larry. He said, Larry, did you hear what just happened? And Larry goes, no. He goes, Elvis, he died. And Larry's like, whoa. So what did you just say? He said, Elvis died. And Larry Geller stated, he looked up at Elvis's uh, bedroom window where he's always at. He looked up. Elvis wasn't there. And he was in a state of shock, you know, he, he wasn't sinking in, the reality wasn't sinking in. And uh, he said uh, a few moments later, Elvis's father, Vernon, walked up to him. Vernon, oh, he said, what was it? Larry, 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 Larry. He, 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 oh, my God, I need you. What am I going to do? Elvis died. And, he, and, uh, and Larry looked at him, they were hugging, they were in shock. And uh, Vernon looked at Larry and said, you got to do his hair. You know how, how Elvis would like it. You got to do his hair. And uh, Larry looked at Vernon Presley, Elvis' father, said, don't you worry, Mr. Presley. I'll have your son's hair done up. Don't, don't worry about it. And Larry Geller went back. He was such shock. He was, he was numb. He, 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 he was almost sick. And then he, after that, he went down to the Baptist Memorial Hospital, and that's where you know, it sunk in. But Jerry Schilling wasn't there. He was on the road and he stated that he heard it over the radio before he heard it from a friend or somebody, you know, that worked with Elvis. And uh, he said he was driving his car and then the radio disc jockey was saying, he was playing one of Elvis' songs. He said, by the late great Elvis Presley. And he said, uh, Jerry, he got, he just lost it. He said, he literally crashed his car into it was a, a brick wall or something crazy. And he said he literally had to have his hands surgically removed from the steering wheel. He was that hard of a crash because he just devastated. And uh, after all those years later, you know, when people said Elvis was alive and all this stuff, how we all wish that was true. How all these Elvis sightings were true. Elvis spotted at Burger King in Calus, Mizzou. Preacher Bob Joyce, people, all the conspirators think he's Elvis. When Bob Joyce flat out admitted he's not Elvis, he just happens to have a voice that's very close to him. And he, and, he, and he just happens to look like how Elvis would look today. The reason why people say what they say about Elvis still being alive, all these conspiracy theories and all this stuff, is because when Elvis was alive, he had such a strong connection with his fans. His fans didn't know how to succumb to the reality that Elvis' death came suddenly. And it was. It came suddenly. And they didn't know how to react to it. You know, it's... They all say that Elvis had a, had a life insurance premium. What was it? Five million bucks. He took off with a night hawk off from back of Graceland. They flew him off the night before. They already did their thing saying that he was deceased. No, he passed away. You know, Elvis was a guy that had a lot of respect. I was, see, I was brought up with Elvis. My mother's cousin, big Elvis fan. 
how did I first hear of Elvis? It was back in 1984. I was driving with my father in his pickup truck. And they're driving around the lakefront, you know, the road is on the edge of the lake, you're looking down the lake. And my father had the radio on. And I heard a singer singing Suspicious Minds. It wasn't the, the concert version of Suspicious Minds, in the, it was in the uh, recording studio version of Suspicious Minds. The part of the, the, the version of it that Elvis didn't like, because he said that the, uh, the backup singer, the band, was overtaking his voice and the way how Elvis would want it. The colonel was playing games, and that, that caused a lot of friction between Elvis and the colonel. And that's the version of Suspicious Minds that I heard on the truck. And that's how it would have, in the radio disc jockey, whatever you want to call him, said, Suspicious Minds by the late great Elvis Presley. That's when I was introduced to Elvis Presley for the first time in my father's pickup truck. It was, uh, I believe it was uh, Saturday morning. We're just driving along. And then I just had to hear uh, Elvis's voice singing the song Suspicious Minds. I didn't think that I was going to be going to be connected with Elvis as strong as I was today, as I am today. Because I can tell you, Larry Geller, Elvis's uh, former makeup artist, reached out to me. Elvis's former uh, bodyguard, Sam Thompson, reached out to me. Elvis's second cousin, what's his name, uh, Danny Smith, reached out to me. I watch his uh, YouTube channel a lot. What was it called? Memphis Kid? I watch that all every now and then, as much as what I can get the chance. I I, I, I reach out to the, the, the Danny uh, Smith as much as I possibly can. And I got to say is, you know, when Elvis died, one of the biggest things with Elvis when he died was he left so much on the table. Nobody dies and leaves all the amount of stuff on the table that Elvis left on the table. Elvis did it. And, uh... What else was it? Uh, Elvis's uh, prescribed medications. See, with Elvis, I don't call him addicted to drugs. I don't. See, Elvis was never a drug addict. He was addicted to prescribed medications that was given to him by Dr. Nick. And if Dr. Nick didn't give it to Elvis, Elvis is going to fire him. And he's going to hire another doctor who will give him the, pres the prescribed medications that he wanted. And to understand Elvis' situation, really, you really got to put yourself in his shoes. Go on tour with him. Go on the road with him. Go in these different cities, these different states, during these different time zones. You know, you're not getting your rest because, you know, you leave one state. It's like uh, 6 o'clock at night, and you go back to another state. It could be like 12 o'clock in the afternoon or something. You know, he's not getting a rest, and I can understand that. But ultimately, what I, what I think what happened was Elvis's way of life, how he wanted it, it was getting harder for him to hold on to that way of life, and it was slowly catching up to him, and he, financially he couldn't do it. And like I said before earlier, that the colonel signed little contracts that Elvis actually couldn't honor because his health was deteriorating. There was a concert that I believe he didn't even show up to because he was too uh, coherent to go out. There was a story that Larry Geller stated that when Elvis was playing in Vegas. He was so uh, coherent, so uh, tomacoast. Really, really out of it, you know, really aching and pain and stuff, you know. They had Elvis on the bed in his private residence that Elvis always had in Vegas at the International Hotel. And uh, they would pull his head, Elvis's head, in an ice cold bucket of water trying to revive him. Because he's going in and out of consciousness quite a bit. A lot of the fans didn't realize they're here, what they're watching. It was in real bad shape at the end of his show. And they said the colonel locked on the door. And he, he opened it up and he pointed to King right at Larry Geller. Where is he? And he just went right in. Didn't care. And Larry said, alright, this is good. The old man's going to see what's going on here. So the colonel comes out. 
You know what I'm saying? Larry Geller, right to that base. He points his cane right, 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 right on Larry Geller's noses. And he said, the only thing that matters is that that man is on stage tonight. Nothing else matters. Nothing. He walked out, shut the door. That was it. And Larry Geller looked back and said, my God, Elvis, he just can't go on like this. He's not going to last another five years. He didn't. He might have got two years out of that at most. And then that fatal, fateful day on August 16th, 1977. You know, it's, see, Elvis, in my opinion, was a gift from God. God will give us friends. God will give us stuff during life. How we treat our friends, how we respect the things and appreciate the things and friends that, Elvis, that God gives us is how God will, re, will treat us when we pass on to the other side, when we go to heaven. And when you look at it today, if, 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 and if it happens today, I had it happen to me. People, you know, they'll treat your, their friends like crap. They'll abuse their friendship, relationships with people. They'll, you know, not, they'll be very unappreciative of the stuff that they have. But when they pass on, everybody pays the price for wrongdoing when they had their life review on the other side. Elvis's concern was when he was uh, having these struggles with these prescribed medications was, is he ever going to reach out for help? No. Uh, Priscilla, she was asked this question in the past by an interviewer on a talk show, and uh, the interviewer, we were asked Priscilla, if Elvis was given the help, would he reach out to it? And she said, no. And she stated, if you would have asked Elvis that, he would have, he would have ballistic. He would have run off his rocker. He would have said, you're not sure. He would have fired you right on the bat. Because he stayed, they stated, every time when people, his friends, went to Elvis for help, to help him out, he'd go berserk. He'd go ballistic. And they said, Elvis is always there to bail you out of a situation and other people out of a situation. But he really didn't want them going to him for him for himself to help him out. And like uh, Red West, Sonny West, and what was the other name's name? Dave Hebner? When they wrote a book about Elvis. In a way, I can see what they're saying. But at the same time, I can see where Elvis is coming from at the same time. Because uh, they wanted Elvis to get help. And he wouldn't. So they may have wrote up a book. This is my opinion what happened. I'm not saying this is it. Maybe these people that know Sonny West's family and Red West's family, they can answer this. Him and Dave Hebner, so I don't know. Only they can answer this. It's in my opinion. They wrote that book so Elvis would see it. And it would hurt him like they planned it. But they wanted to, to encourage him. Sorry, I got to reach help because now this book is on the shelves. Everybody sees it. I'm done. And so when Elvis came on stage, you know, performed one of his shows, he's overweight, he's bloated, everything what they said in that book, there's Elvis in that exact same situation. I believe that was the intention. So it gives Elvis courage, get a mad nuts, all right, I got to stop and get, get help. But instead, you know, uh, well, see, the reason why, uh, the one of the reason, the things why they say, uh, they set up, uh, Red West, Sunny West, Dave Hedner were fired was because of budget cuts. But if you check the hit background, Red West, Sunny West were known for going to Elvis to get him some help. And Sunny West was very mad at the, at, the, at, the, at the situation that Elvis was in. And he stated Elvis was on stage knocking the fans dead. And he stated the drugs just simply took it away from him. He said, there's nothing better they like to see than to see Elvis on stage, knocking the fans dead, performing a cardi kick on the stage, and entertaining the fans. But he said the drugs took it away from him. In my opinion, I believe they're right. I understand what they did. But I understand Elvis' side of it, too, because Elvis said, oh, my God, they, they, they attacked me like this. I, I, I. How can I trust them? They were in my inner circle. They were my friends. They were in my house. We did everything together. And he attacked me like that. 
I can understand where Elvis is saying, but I see their side also. I'm going to stay in the middle of it. I ain't going to get too involved in it. But I got to say, as you know, if Elvis would have fired the colonel, and if he wasn't signing these contracts that Elvis couldn't keep up with, there's a good chance that Elvis would still be here today. He'd be, he'd be 90 years old today, but, you know, there's a chance that he would, well, he would have lived a lot longer. But on the other hand, when you look at Elvis's family genes, they don't live old. They don't. They, in fact, they die young. Elvis's mother died young. Uh, two years after Elvis died, Vernon Presley passed away. Elvis's father passed away. Elvis passed away two years before I was born. So this year on August sixteenth, I'm uh, this year on August sixteenth, two thousand and twenty-four. I ask you guys. At 3.30 p.m., pause, have a moment, reflect, and remember Elvis Presley. Elvis was declared dead at 3.30 in the afternoon, but he was found around 9 o'clock in the washroom by his girlfriend or fiance, Ginger Alter, in my opinion. He was dead around 9 o'clock. I say Elvis died around 9 o'clock. They did get up in the hospital. They used DOA. When you see DOA... Dead on arrival. That's exactly what Elvis was. So, in my opinion, they just he my it's my opinion. Elvis died around nine o'clock in the morning, but they just declared him dead at three thirty in the afternoon because he just wanted to do some stuff, want to work on just so that their angles were covered. So they did it. But ultimately, what it comes down to is you only can do so much. But when I see this here, I got a lot of respect for this man. I really do. I have a lot of respect for Elvis. I mean. If there's anybody, you know, I don't know, this here, I don't know if you can see it or not, because Elvis is a book on Elvis, this is history, this is grave site, but you know, uh, what's his name, what's Elvis' half-brother's name, uh, David Stanley, is there a Rick Stanley? I read his book when he said he had to cater to Elvis for his, uh, Injections, attacks one, two, and three. And he said they had to hold Elvis up when they're feeding him so he don't choke on his food. And uh, he went to Elvis trying to get him some help. He couldn't do it. But what was it? A couple days before Elvis passed away, I don't can't remember if it was David Stanley. But anyways, one of them went upstairs. They told him that Elvis said, you're the king. And Elvis whipped up the Bible and said, there's only one king. He said, that's Jesus Christ. So I'm just a singer. And there's an old saying, what I say, the similar to what Elvis said with the book, with the Bible, well, that's, I'm no king, but Jesus Christ is the king. And my old saying is, no matter <clears throat> what you accomplish in life, don't matter how much money you have or you make in life, nobody is better than anybody. <coughs> Everybody's equal, and everybody's the same. And that's my saying. And I got to say is, you know, if you only could have been helped, if Elvis only could be helped, which he couldn't. And uh, a day before Elvis died, I believe David Stanley is one of the Elvis's half-brothers. He met Elvis. Elvis came up crying and hugging him and all this stuff. And he said, I ain't never going to see you again. And he stated, I'm going to next time I see you, it's going to be on a higher plane in a higher place. And he said, Elvis hugged him and he cried and he left. And uh, I believe it was David Stanley. And he stated, that was the last time I seen Elvis alive. He didn't know what he meant. He, he just couldn't understand it, but the next day he it all came. Elvis knew he was going to die, but then again, it goes back to Joe Esposito. When he had stated when he was working on Elvis, when he had stated before the Memphis Police Department had arrived, he flushed Elvis's uh, medication down the toilet, but he also burnt a note that Elvis left behind, which was what we call a suicide note. And then you. Look at what George Bizzuto said compared to what David Stanley stated. It makes sense. 
There's evidence right there. Elvis himself. And uh, me, when I think of Elvis, nothing but respect. Nothing but respect. Because the man worked for it. He deserves what he got. All that fame. He deserves all the glory because he worked for it all. But I got to say is, you know, if you only could be helped. So, on August 16th of this year, at 3.30 in the afternoon, I ask that you pause. We have a moment of silence for the late, great Elvis Presley. 